Um, my name is Greg Jones. I'm a professor at Southern Oregon University. Uh, I've been there since 1997. I teach in the Environmental Studies Department there, uh, mostly uh, weather, climate, uh, statistics, uh, mapping, uh, things allied very much with the uh, wine industry in general. But I, uh, I started studying uh, viticulture in, in, as part of my climate research when I was a, a graduate student uh, years ago. I, I saw very quickly that uh, people in the wine industry, viticulturists and enologists and the wine industry in general, knew quite a bit about climate because they had to, but not really in depth. And then I saw that there were almost no climatologists that were studying viticulture. I mean, we can look in Europe and you can, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen, but in Schloss Johannesburg, where Johannesburg Riesling is from, they have a, a, a marker there for the 50 degree latitude uh, line. And that used to be the northern fringe of viticulture. And now you find viticulture up to 52, 53, 54 uh, degrees. And so it, that's clearly happened. You can even go to places in Oregon, go to the Willamette Valley. When, when some of the earliest people came post-prohibition to Oregon, Richard Summer, David Lett, Dick Erath, these guys, when they came to Oregon, people in California thought they were nuts because the baseline climate then, so just simply, was right at the margin. You could get one good climate, uh, one good year, climatic year in maybe five, six, seven, eight to produce a pretty good crop at that point in time. But it was a challenge the rest of the time. It was, I mean, if, we, if you look back at the data, it's just hard to understand how they had the, you know, the cojones to do it. I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> if you look at the Willamette Valley of the, of the 60s and 70s and, and that framework, and you, you know, fast forward to today, I mean, we're talking about a place that now is eight years and ten, nine years and ten of a good, ripable uh, vintage. You know, there's still issues. There still can be rain during harvest. There can still be frost. But, but the the baseline structure and suitability is very different. And here's a good one. Um, if you if you say, okay, well, the climates of the Willamette Valley in the '60s and '70s were what they were. Where are those today? which is kind of an interesting question. And it really is up in the Puget Sound region. If you look at the inner parts of the Puget Sound and through some of the canals and islands there, the climate structure there is really not much different than it was in the 70s and maybe even early 80s in, in the Willamette Valley. Well, I, I've been pretty much throughout everywhere I think possibly has suitability to grow grapes. Um, in the Puget Sound, there's tremendous numbers of the valleys on the east side uh, of the Sound that I think have some pretty good potential. Uh, there is some potential south of Olympia, too, uh, that hasn't been largely explored, but I think that there's, there's definitely uh, opportunity there. In the Willamette Valley, I think that the east side of the Willamette Valley is where there's a lot of potential future growth. It's not much planted there right now, and I think that that will get better over time. I've of course been throughout most of eastern Washington, maybe not everywhere, but but to the the main areas. And you know, I think that you know their suitability there is is tied to some other factors. You know, on the east side of the Cascades, it's all about winter freeze. If if the industry there can survive winter freeze, then that's their major card. Other than that. They have plenty of warmth during the summertime, and fortunately, they have plenty of water. If we take projections right now, and we look forward in time, most of our projections are saying that we're going to get more rain than we will snow, that the snow levels will go up slightly higher in elevation. And what that typically means is that it moves our water delivery earlier in the year. And that earliness, what it basically ends up doing is, is that it puts water where we get the bulk of our water resources at the time when we don't need it. That could be a real problem. And we, we really need to assess that in the Western United States. Um, I just came back from Australia, and here's a great example. 10 years of drought will change everybody's perception. Uh, Australia is really struggling right now. If you went up to Eastern Washington or even here in the Rogue Valley and said, you only have 20% of your allocation this year, people would be hurt. You know, and so we, um, we have to realize that water is going to be a big issue no matter if if growing suitability increases we may have water limitations you know i, I often hear people say well you know well maybe you should be studying something like a, a staple food crop like uh, corn and soybeans and i say well my colleagues do that you know and and i support them in every way i possibly can and and so 
yes, it's, this is a more of a frivolous kind of crop and, 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 and thing that we may not need if we had food security issues, but, but it's one piece of the puzzle. And you know, the, the, the issue with climate change is, is that it's a, it's a slow process. And when we talk about, when you hear climatologists or you hear the media talk about a degree here or a degree there, that doesn't resonate you know, really well with people. But when you talk about variability increasing, extremes increasing, and, and, and seeing the things that we do, then, then that starts to resonate. And, and I think that um, you know, we have to be able to, uh, we don't know everything. The climate science doesn't know everything, this clearly. But I tell you what, we're in a different place today than we were 15 years ago. I mean, we are clearly in a much different place. And, and it's our understanding that, that the climate system has a lot of resiliency, it has a lot of unknowns, but we're also playing a bigger, bigger role in it. And so we have to consider those, those factors. And um, I, I think with that, I, my job as a, as a professor and an instructor is to bring awareness. If I can somehow, through studying structure and suitability for uh, wine grapes, bring about awareness about a bigger societal issue like climate change, then why not? Greg comes here twice a year, does, puts a little thing up there and goes, shazam, and then he gives us weather data. That's magic. But now in terms of the participating vineyards, where do you rank in terms of uh, uh, north, south, east, west. For the Umqua, we're the southernmost location, and among the more easterly locations, we're we're more we're further from the ocean and further south. Mm -hmm. And then the ones in the Rogue, you know, we would be north of all of those. Yeah, I can say that uh, this is row 29, Umqua trial and it goes three rows over. There are 90 plants, nine varietals. Uh, so each, like this first uh, five plants here are Grenache. And then the next plant in alphabetical order is uh, Malbec, I guess. And then it just repeats itself alphabetically as it goes around. That way the distribution of the plants over the plot are randomized so that the effect of soil vari variability um, and hillside effect, uh, solar insulation, rain, etc., is averaged out, if you would. Is there any hardship or extra work involved on on your part? And oh, it's killing me. I can't continue this project. <laughs> no, it's not. It's fun, kind of, to drive a row and to see the variability, like it flowering. You learn something there. And also it's all own rooted and so you learn something in that regard because most of us are not planted own rooted and therefore we get to see what the vine does in its natural situation and then we utilize the fruit for something uh, you know whatever we make vintners blend so that's a great thing for abasala we put it all in this in the same pot